Thanks for a warm introduction and the very good pronunciation of my name. Let's not worry about this name anymore. Um, this talk is not about me, but about some of the things that I think are important right now in the world. So, as, uh, as he said, when I got back from my travels in South America, I found a job in consulting. But it did take me a year to, found that to find that job. Because when I got back, Europe was on the brink of the financial crisis. So the subprime mortgage lenders in the US devised, uh, well, gave basically lend, uh, loans to people who really couldn't afford houses. Um, they gave the loans and the investment banks did a lot of magic with it, managed to sell it, and eventually the whole system collapsed. And when the finance system collapsed, then unfortunately also the economic system quickly follows. So once Lehman Brothers kind of uh, went down the drain, the rest of the world followed suit. So I was stuck in Europe, two degrees, one year of travel, and unemployed. Especially I wanted to work in consulting, in consulting in sustainability, but it's perhaps not really the focus of the things anymore. And it only got worse really along the way, despite the fact that I did find a job. Uh, I just really noticed that our political uh, parties and our political powers were very much distracted by other problems that are occurring in the world. So the EU is still kind of shaking on its foundations. We have Greece, we have Italy in problems. Uh, we obviously had the Arab Spring, which takes up a lot of the attention, and attention is a very scarce resource. And we have the, uh, the scarcity, let's say, of mental health in North Korea that is still occupying the minds of most of our democratic leaders. So one of the things that kind of got lost along track was this uh, graph of ever-increasing carbon emissions. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'm pretty sure it's going to be covered later. But we are really near the, 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 the tipping point. So if we go beyond 32.6 gigatons per year, then we are basically admitting defeat and that we're admitting that the world will warm more than 2 degrees centigrade. Not really what we want. I'm not going to focus too much on the many, many negative uh, consequences of global warming, but I'm going to try to have a slightly more optimistic story. However optimistic, we have to be caution, cautious as well. So in 2009, Copenhagen wasn't really the success we'd hoped for, kind of as a conference, kind of really failed. But on the other side of the graph, we see that there is something good happening on the development scale. So we see that development aid is still increasing, and more importantly, people are still being lifted out of poverty. Between 2005 and 2010, about 500 million people got lifted out of the most dire forms of poverty. Now, some of the people we can thank for this are on the left, uh, Mohamed Yunus, the guy who started Grameen Bank. He came up with the idea of changing uh, physical collateral, such as houses for social collateral, such as group lending, and basically managed to find ways to profitably give financial services to the poor. Um, those uh, banks that use this kind of microcredits have a higher repayment rate than any bank in the UK, on the US, or in Europe. On the other side, we have a very different, uh, different person, Lee Scott. He's a CEO from Walmart, and people have argued that if that guy on the left, uh, well, on your right, um, has gotten the Nobel Prize for Peace, Lee Scott should as well, because he lifted at least one million people in China out of poverty by providing employment. So, as a former economist uh, turned management scholar, this is one of the things I've always been very interested in. Economics is known as the science of scarcity. So, because there's never enough, never enough of anything for everyone, the economic system is really there to allocate resources as efficiently as possible. Now, Thomas Sowell argued that politics should disregard this first lesson of scarcity because it has a different goal. Now, I think, unfortunately, that politics has listened too much to Sowell and disregarded issues of scarcity for way too long and that this is now really going to hit us in the face. And the economic system has done fairly well. We've created a lot of prosperity all over the world, but the economic system is not really meant to create equitable solutions. This is unfortunate, but if the goal is optimal allocation of resources and we start with an inequitable um, allocation of resources, it's unlikely that we'll end up with an equitable solution. So the fact that this is so is also not very strange. If you look at this quote from uh, former Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman, he said, the only responsibility of a business is to increase profits, with the exception that we shouldn't really deceive or commit fraud. Now, well, the, um, we don't really have to be deceptive to say that this is a duck, so there's nothing deceptive about it. However, uh, you can buy it, and we're very honest, like it says, this product contains chemicals known by the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects. 
and we sell it to children. So it's not deceptive, but it's not really the world that maybe we are hoping for. So, and it's always difficult to get a, yeah, designing good products or delivering good services is not necessarily effective or not necessarily easy, as we've recently experienced in our lasagnas. So despite all these kind of scam mongering and sad stories, I don't think there is any point in uh, despair. Despair generally doesn't create innovation. Hope does. So we go back to the big scientists of the 20th century and listen that, OK, apparently we have to change the way we think about things. And a lot of people are doing so in the business world. And I'm obviously a businessman. So a lot of people are saying that we have to integrate sustainability in the DNA of our companies, in the very business model of what we want to do. And only if we, can, if we do that, then sustainability can actually make sense. And I do believe that this is true. So sustainability in business is generally economic, environment and social. Now obviously I agree in principle with someone like Al Gore who says there's no point in balancing the, econ the economy with the environment because the environment can survive with the, without the economy but the economy can never survive without the environment. In principle I agree in business that doesn't work. We have to get growth, we have to be able to make a profit otherwise a business can't be sustainable. So if we need growth, and every living system needs growth, ask this to the inventor, well, the discoverer of DNA, Francis Crick. So if we need growth to survive, we need an innovation. And innovation can come in many ways. They don't need to be technological. But innovation is about doing something new. Very simple. And what we need for that, as often, is new business models. And this is the guy, Alexander Osterwalder. I had the pleasure of presenting with him seven years ago, five years ago who kind of invented business models. He wrote this very famous book about it after finishing his PhD in Lausanne and uh, made something that looked a lot like this. This is uh, work that we did when, we were, when I was a consultant. So a business model is something very complex, but on the other hand, something very simple. It tries to summarize in one figure what a business does, how it makes money, how it does what it does, and who it does it for. So, and this kind of perspective is very convincing to talk to businesses about. Because if you, if you look at all the external threats we're facing, I think it makes sense to look at them as opportunities. So if you look at this Chinese word, for everyone who speaks Chinese, um, this is crisis, and it's, it consists of two separate words. One is opportunity, the other is danger. So let's focus on the opportunity. Because the opportunities are big, and the problems are big as well, but this is how it goes. It's two sides of the same coin. So reducing poverty, despite the progress we've made in the last uh, 10, 20 years, remains a big problem. But there is a lot of good stuff happening around that. So we see Aravind in India, who've mass customized eye surgeries and have been able to give sight to over 2 million people in the last 40 years for free while running a profitable business. We see a company like NHH, I'm not going to pronounce it, but don't confuse it with the NHS, it is very different. Um, who've managed to mass customize heart surgery, one of the most expensive surgeries you can go, well, you can face in the UK or anywhere else, they can do heart surgery for about $2,000 per person. In the UK, it will cost you about 30 to 50,000 uh, pounds. And they're probably, because they do it so much and it's so well engineered, they're probably better at it. Um, we see companies like Philips, who've uh, developed this uh, uh, thing on, the, on your right, the Chula, um, to kind of deal with respiratory distress caused by cooking inside. When people just cook inside in huts in Africa, then um, the smoke uh, stays in the hut, and this is one of the main causes for child death. So they've, they basically devised this very cheap um, stove that people can use, and it's only, it only uses local materials. An alternative is you're using solar power, to solar power to directly heat your food. And these guys are recently discovered, they're amazing. They are a Brazilian company, and they have found a new way of dealing with the problem of larvae and stink bugs that are threatening our crops. What they did is they genetically engineered wasps. I know it's a dangerous word, but still, they managed to genetically engineer wasps to only, to, to only eat these uh, larvae and these stink bugs, and they're unleashing them on uh, massive crops crop sites, and these wasps are just becoming uh, part of, becoming a natural predator and basically take away the need for pesticides. And while pesticides are essential for our food, they're also very detrimental. The estimated costs of pesticide use in the US alone is about $10 billion a year. So 
that's a big market for them to tackle. And I think one of the most promising things is that we get this new wave of innovation, which we call, we, well, the academics have begun to call reverse innovation, which is basically when innovation comes back from the developing world to us. So we see GE that have uh, developed in India a new low-cost ECG, a new kind of steam turbine. We see Walmart that is introducing small stores in New York because they realized that when they went to Mexico, they couldn't really run with their big store model because nobody wanted that in Mexico. And we see Tata, the Indian car company, that is soon to be in, soon introducing its uh, nano car, the $2,500 car, uh, in Europe. So these are interesting innovation movements. But obviously, all this kind of industrialization and these new innovations might come at a price. So if we don't want the left to turn into the right or the right to turn into the left, so basically if you want to avoid drowning or drying out, we kind of need to do something about the whole environmental problem as well. And I think two of the most inspirational people that are really working on this in, very many, in a variety of ways are Michael Browngart and William McDonough. And they wrote this book, Cradle to Cradle, which details their philosophy. And the book itself is a fully recyclable polymer. And the first chapter of the book is called, I Am Not a Tree. Because it's a recyclable polymer, it's the first book you can read while showering. So they argue that the, first, the, the, the current situation of the way we devise our economy is characterized mainly by linear thinking. So, and they said, if we continue on this linear path, eventually we're going to hit a wall. Because... The world is a finite place, so we need to move towards more circular thinking. And we need to be able to design our products and our services in such a way that we can either um, biodegrade them so that they end up in the biological cycle, or either that we can recycle them without losing the quality, so without downcycling, um, and that we can basically create products that have an eternal life. Therefore, it's called cradle to cradle, rather than cradle to grave. So, Technologically quite challenging, but is it worth it? Well, we see companies in the carpet industry who are doing this at a very, very advanced levels. We see companies in, uh, like Steelcase who are making chairs, also managing to do this, um, building cradle-to-cradle -cradle products. We see companies that I've worked with, try, like Philips, trying to redesign televisions from a cradle-to-cradle -cradle perspective, working together with other companies in the value chain, waste recyclers and Yumicore precious metal recycling to optimize the reusability of uh, the, the materials embedded in the product as from the design process. So we see these kind of big trends and then you see the big projects also done by William McDonough himself. So this is the, cor the corporate co uh, campus for the Gap and that's the Ford Rouge. So it's the, the photo on the right is the biggest green, gr uh, green rooftop in the world. Um, it, Basically, our buildings that are built like trees, so they have the same function. They cl uh, clear the air, they provide oxygen, they provide habitat for species, and uh, they create energy, and they all have the potential to be net energy producers. So we can actually build these kind of buildings, which is quite interesting. Now, is it also worth it? Well, if you look at the cradle-to-grave economy that we're in now, well, it creates a lot of waste, of course. So uh, the EU and the US together create about 8.6 billion tons of waste every year. That's a lot of waste. So, and uh, McKinsey, recently commissioned by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, did some calculations to see, could we move towards a more circular perspective? And they found that if we would, um, and only for 50% of the companies currently in Europe that they actually tested, we could save $630 billion a year only in material costs. And this is with current technology and with a 25% recycling rate. This is a very minimal number. This is a low estimate of what we could save. So there is some value in it. But at the moment, we're still throwing things away. So where is a way when the world is a finite place that's going around? So this is a way. So these are the landfills. This is what we consider to be a way. This is also a way because it's not only landfilled, but it's also ocean filled. I think this guy is on his way to work, but run into some kind of yeah, traffic jam or something. So that's not really a nice thing to see. And especially our oceans as a very sensitive ecosystem are incredibly important. So if you look at these specific, uh, as all these, at all these gyres, like basically creating natural currents um, into which, um, well, in which plastic can so get strapped and they can't get out of these gyres, so it's not very easy. And they did tests in 2005 in this North Pacific gyre and they tested the amount of plankton versus the amount of plastic, and they found that there was five times more plastic than plankton, 
which is not very good because plankton is the basis of the food chain in the oceans. In 2009, they repeated the tests and they found 45 times more plastic. Now, that's not very promising because we're really poisoning ourselves. If we want to go to the shop and have fish with plastic, that's probably not going to be what we want because we didn't like our lasagnas with horse either. So, Luckily, uh, once again, we see companies innovating in this, in this field. We see the Italian company Aquafil and Starsock, a sock company with a very original name because they have stars on their socks. Don't know who came up with that. But um, they're going to recycle um, the fishing nets that are now in the sea. About 10% of the oceanic waste are fishing nets. They've devised a the technology so that they can actually recycle these fishing nets and build new products. Um, and then there's this 19-year-old kid that I ran into like a few months ago, Boyan Slut, who developed a technology that could solve all these problems, in theory, but still, he's tested it and it seems to work quite well, using nothing but solar energy and tidal currents. So, to filter out all the plastics in the oceans and basically solve the five big gyres that we saw before and remove all the plastic from that in a profitable manner. Now, um, he said we could do it in five years. It's a long time, but the previous estimate for cleaning the oceans was 78,000 years. So, not too bad for a 19-year-old kid who is still in college. So, and after all this talk about oceans, obviously oceans are important, but there's also drinking water. Although 71% of the earth is water, less than 2.5% is drinkable. And so, and most of that 2.5% is still embedded in ice, and we actually wanted to stay there. But, so drinking water is a big problem, but we see many companies, again, all over the world, finding very cheap solutions for people who don't have access to drinking water. We see companies like 3M on the right that uh, managed to invent something that can actually go, a machine that goes into pipes and fix leakages from the inside without forcing um, the owner of the pipes to basically dig out the pipes and fix, fix the leakage, which is very important because annual leakage caused by these kind of problems in pipes is enough to satisfy demand for the biggest 10 cities in the world. So we're, doing, we're losing a lot of treated water. And then obviously we can't talk about all these, all these things without talking about energy. When it comes to scarcity, there's probably an abundance of some of the uh, energy sources like shale gas and coal, which is a bit unfortunate maybe, but all the other resources are fairly scarce. So luckily there again we see a lot of innovation. Solar City recently got 150 million US dollar in VC funding, which means that suddenly solar is profitable because VCs don't fund it if they don't get a six-fold return over a period of five to seven years. And we see other progress as well. We see the uh, concentrated solar power systems rising up that are basically managed to provide energy for entire cities. We see a lot of wind energy growing. It's not growing fast enough and the people from Siemens even say we actually need more competition and we need, more, uh, we need better systems and we need better grids to really make it work. And then finally we have transport and transport is incredibly important and it's been kind of quiet for a long time uh, in transport until the last, let's say, 10, maybe 12, 15 years. But the last 10 years have been incredible. So now we have these kind of high, high, high speed trains called the maglev trains, magnetic, uh, magnetic levitation trains in China and Japan, which go about 400 kilometers an hour and are a lot less damaging to the environment than planes. So they're faster and they're cleaner. Um, we have guys like Shai Agassi who managed to convince the Israeli government to invest in the infrastructure for electrical cars in Israel and they're launching their project together with Renault and Nissan. We have a guy like this, um, Elon Musk, I guess some of you must know him, uh, after reinventing online paying with PayPal and uh, space exploration with his company SpaceX. He started Tesla because he was, he's also an owner of Solar City, so he's kind of a a deity in uh, the entrepreneurial world, but he started Tesla with the idea that, okay, driving clean and driving fast should perhaps go together, and it should also be fun. And they've done incredibly well, and while others might say, well, electrical cars are still for the future, I think this guy is building the future right now. So the last story I want to tell goes back to Colombia, where I um, basically spent the last three months of my travels in South America. And this is an interesting story because it's a completely different story. It's not a corporate story, but it's a story about massive innovation with a massive impact. This guy, Paul Lugari, who's been called the inventor of the world, 
by the famous uh, writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, in 76 started his project in a village he was living in with some scientists and some uh, school kids and some street kids, uh, trying to revitalize his area, the area in, in, in which he was living. And for some reason, they managed to convince the Japanese to help them out a little bit, and they uh, built, well, they basically planted uh, 31 square miles of trees, that's over two million trees um, that they planted. And um, the, the soil, which was destroyed by droughts, can, uh, because they used these kind of in the formerly indigenous trees, retook and they started growing, the trees grew really well, they started growing businesses as a direct consequence of these trees, so resin production for paper and paint, biodiesel production, and, and all of these trees kept on growing, which increased precipitation, which allowed them to bottle the water because it was super uh, healthy and sell that bottle as natural water uh, close in Bogota, the capital. And increasingly, plant species returned and about 22 years later, they realized that what they bought in the, in the beginning, in the 70s, late 70s, for one dollar a hectare, was now worth over $3,000 a hectare. So that's a value increase that exceeds Microsoft or any other company that's, um, that's really existed in the, in the, over this long a period. So this is the most profitable organization, or the most... Uh, the organization that managed to grow most strictly from a sustainability perspective. So this is all from my talk. I think that what I wanted to say is that innovation has always happened and increasingly we're realizing that innovation has to happen within specific limits because there's scarcity of uh, environmental limits, there's scarcity in financial limits, there's scarcity about the resources we can use and extract, there's scarcity in the clean air, there's a lot of forms of scarcity, there's probably scarcity in good governance and in education, but I think increasingly we're realizing that this kind of innovation occurs within this world and only if we want to preserve this world then we need to take those limitations that are embedded in the world into account into our future and then hopefully there is still hope. Thank you.